presentation of dialogue on Idaho Public Television is made possible through the generous support of the Laura Moore Cunningham Foundation, committed to fulfilling the Moore and Bettis family legacy of building the great state of Idaho. By the Friends of Idaho Public Television and by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. I never lost faith. And that is something that, uh, because I knew the truth, and you know, the truth will set you free, as they say. Coming up, he spent eight years, 10 months, and 19 days behind bars for a crime he didn't commit. The harrowing tale of death row inmate Kirk Bloodsworth is the subject of a new documentary by an Idaho filmmaker. We'll talk about it next on Dialogue. Stay tuned. It was, by any measure, a most horrid crime. On a hot summer's day in 1984, a little girl is found brutally murdered and sexually assaulted in the woods in Rosedale. Two weeks later, Baltimore County Police arrested Kirk Bloodsworth. A jury convicted him. A judge sentenced him to death. Mr. Bloodsworth, you want to make any statement at all? Who bad the way, please? Not guilty. It was a tragic murder. There's no doubt about it. Everybody was talking about it. A little girl, my wife and I, we were watching the news together and the composite sketch comes up. And she turned around and looked at me. I said, what are you looking at me for? And she said, well, it does look like you a little bit. There was no blood, no hair, no fibers, no nothing that connected me whatsoever other than the eyewitness testimony. It was completely circumstantial, completely. I was arrested in August of 1984, and by March of 1985, I was heading to death row. Guilty, guilty, guilty. And that resonates to you like a hammer, man, especially when you know the truth. Hello and welcome to Dialogue, I'm Marcia Franklin. You were just listening to a preview for Bloodsworth, An Innocent Man, a documentary by an Idaho filmmaker about the nightmarish story of Kirk Bloodsworth. As you heard, in 1985, Bloodsworth was convicted of brutally murdering a little girl and was sentenced to death. All along, he maintained his innocence and worked to clear his name. Nearly nine years later, it finally happened. DNA evidence preserved from the scene of the crime showed that Bloodsworth was not guilty. He was released, but it took 10 more years before authorities used the same DNA evidence to find the real killer. The tale of how Mr. Bloodsworth kept going and what he's done with his freedom since has been preserved itself in the film. And here to talk about the documentary is its director, Gregory Bain, and Kirk Bloodsworth. Welcome. Welcome to, Thanks for having to us. both of you. Thank you, Marcia. Well, first of all, uh, Gregory, as I understand it, you heard Mr. Bloodsworth speak back in 2011, mm -hmm. and uh, you'd worked on other other films, and you became convinced right then and there that this was something that you wanted to pursue as as a documentarian, as a filmmaker. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I had I had seen Kirk speak at uh, it was May 2011 at an Idaho Innocence um, project. Um, uh, I think it was a fundraiser, actually. Yeah. And, uh, and that's a group that works on these issues. Th yeah, exactly. Um, and uh, we had met a little bit prior to that. Um, I actually had gone and filmed. That was the first thing I'd filmed with, with Kirk. And, yeah, he just, you know, when you look at documentaries, um, you know, you, you initially you want a great subject. And, and if you have a great storyteller to go along with that subject, then it's sort of a no-brainer. No um, so that's kind of why I, I jumped at the story. Um, I also thought it was just, you know, incredibly interesting. I mean, there's, there's obviously all the, you know, the issues surrounding the death penalty and everything else within the context of the story. But for me, it was interesting, you know, how does this happen and how do you come out of it and how do you go on and make something of your life when, when, you know, Essentially, you know, the time period where most of us are trying to decide who we are as human beings is you know, stripped from you, and you're stuck in a prison cell. So you're interested in a character study, it sounds like, almost. Yeah, that seems to be kind of my shtick, I guess. But, <laughs> <laughs> um, so but I was very curious about... Not an activist film, say, against the death penalty. Right, no. To me, I always start with the story. Is the story interesting? Is the character, you know, uh, 
you're not a caricature, but it, but is the the main character driving the story interesting and compelling? And and he was all of that, and and told his story incredibly well. And and the film is is really shaped, um, you know, obviously by by Kirk's telling of his own story. Yeah, and we'll talk about that. Um, Kirk, you've been on. Oh, I think we were talking beforehand. You've lost count of how many television programs you've been on. I mean, including Oprah Winfrey and mm -hmm. Geraldo Rivera, mm -hmm. Larry King. You've written a book. You lecture all over the world on this subject. What compelled you to make this documentary with with Gregory? Well, I, you know, as a, as a public speaker, you, you can only go so far, and uh, I wanted to. I've been wanting to make a have a film made of the story, not just uh, of myself, but to tell how easily it can happen. Because if it can happen to an honorably discharged Marine, which is my, my, my theme anyway, when I talk to people, it can happen to anybody in America. Gregory just asked me, uh, could I do it? And I said, fine. And uh, sure, whatever you want to do. And, and four years later, and a lot of <laughs> phone calls, and many, many hours sitting in his basement, I. Uh, Filming this thing, we uh, we finally come up with a what I think is a very good uh, a good uh, uh, you know legend for the for the world to to see my story. We don't unfortunately have time to go into a lot of detail about the case. That's why people should check out the documentary, uh, which which is online. But this was a case this this murder that people all over the country knew about was heinous mm -hmm. crime is all mm -hmm. over the, the, the TV news. Indeed. You had seen reports about it. Yeah. Then a couple of weeks later, bang, 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 knock on the door, and you're taken away. Mm -hmm. And as we saw in the, the trailer, it was a combination of, in, when I looked at your face, a combination of confusion, anger, fear, everything going on and even when you were watching that video here when we just played it I saw you shake your head one more time yeah. after all the times you've seen that video yeah it was um, anything that could go wrong did <laughs> and in my life at that point I was 23 years old and the next thing I know I was literally fighting for my life uh, nobody wanted to listen to me nobody wanted to believe me and and of all the things for that to happen to and what I was accused of was this visceral, uh, ugly, awful, horrific thing that uh, I had to sort of carry the yoke with for many years. I mean, 19 years in total, I think, before they caught the real killer. And mm -hmm. so it's um, it was it's it's hard to look at in some you know. And I tell this story. I've been telling this story for 22 years. So it's. Uh, you know, to see Greg's film, he really, he really did it justice, I think, and it really puts out what I, how I feel in all aspects of it. So, um, well, as you say, anything that could go wrong did go wrong. It did. You had an attorney who was not very skilled at all. Yeah. You even had your, your your wife at the time even thought, oh well, that kind of looks like you. So she wasn't yeah. much help, uh, and people were shown TV footage and your photo before they even identified you so they were right. essentially uh, the, the authorities were feeding information to people to get them to say right. he did it right. um, why do you think that there was this rush to judgment fear I believe it was fear I, I think the prosecutors and the police department and the community in general uh, feared that they didn't want to have this person and that fear makes us do a lot of crazy things and uh, I people tell me uh, or ask me that question all the time and I, I tell them the same thing it was fear people did not want um, potential uh, killer walking around on the walking streets. around but in, in in hindsight if you look at it they allowed it to happen because mm -hmm. the real killer um, um, wound up attacking someone else even after he had killed Dawn. Well, um, I think your documentary does a, a good job, including through this animation of, of talking about or showing the claustrophobia mm. of, of being first in jail yeah. and then in prison with the uh, 
chamber, mm -hmm. death, cha death chamber right over your cell, cell yeah. which the guards never let you forget. Mm -mm. Um, but flash forward to you in the library and in the, in the prison, and a book really started all of this, didn't it? Yeah, it was a book written by Joseph Wombaugh called The Blooding. And the first time a, um, a new technology was ever used in a criminal case, and that technology, of course, is DNA, dioxyribonucleic acid. I could not pronounce it, Marsha, back then, but I can today. You've gone to college and you have a master's degree. I, I don't know about that, but I certainly, <laughs> um, it was, it was a, a unique uh, technology that has freed and captured many people in the United States, and uh, I am just uh, blessed that I happened to come across that, uh, that book. And by then, um, you had an attorney, an appellate attorney, who was very skilled, yes. who did care about you, Bob Morin, yeah. right? Yep. Who's now a, a appellate judge, right? In, Actually, in he's a did superior he, court judge superior in Washington, court judge, Washington, judge in Washington, D.C. Um, and I'd like to roll a clip because a uh, combination of having finally a, a guy on your case who, who cared and, and had some skills plus this uh, new technology drove you and to drive him yeah. to find the answer. Yeah. I said, Bob, we, we got to find this DNA stuff. We got to get the evidence out of the courthouse. He said, Kirk, I, I've been there. It's not there. They don't know where it is. They've done something with it. And I said, Bob, you got to go back and check. He said, I've already been twice. I said, man, you got to go one more time. If you don't, I'm going to call you 20 times a day instead of 10. He went back to the courthouse and he went to the evidence place where it was supposed to be. And lo and behold, it wasn't there. But he happened to be passing by a second trial judge's court clerk in the hallway. The clerk said, Bob, what are you doing here? He says, I'm looking for the Hamilton evidence in the Kirk Bloodsworth case. He said, well, I know where that is. It's in the judge's closet in a paper bag sitting in the floor in a cardboard box. Paper bag in a cardboard box in the judge's closet. And that was my key to my freedom. You know, <laughs> you can watch this a lot of times and it still hits you the yeah. same way. I mean, what, it, for goodness sakes, what was that kind of evidence doing in a paper bag in a closet? Do you think it was intentional, that it was hidden away? You know, I'm just going to leave that to the people that left it there. I, I honestly don't know, but it's lucky. I was lucky that they found it. I mean, you know, there's a lot of similar uh, situations like that in, in uh, pe people who have been exonerated, like myself. Um, evidence found somewhere else. There was evidence in one case found in a woman's garage. She was scrapbooking the pieces of evidence in this guy's case. He wound up doing 20 years for a rape he never committed. Marvin Anderson in Virginia. So I am just one of many over 360 or so people who have been exonerated through DNA in the United States and they're still coming every three days now. Every three days a new... Just about a new Do exoneration. You, uh, how much of a role did, does faith or did faith play in keeping you going and also perhaps in these type of situations, the way that you look at them? I mean, well, I, I believe in God, and I'm a Catholic, uh, uh, you know, f for the, uh, God's grace, here I am. And uh, I, I, I owe a, gra a great deal of gratitude to the one that created me. And uh, I'm very humbled by it. And if it wasn't for that, I never lost faith. And that is something that, um, because I knew the truth, and you know, the truth will set you free, as they say. Not all the time, but in my case, um, I was blessed. And uh, here I sit and, and on your show, so I'm a lucky man indeed. That DNA was tested, and you got the call yeah. that you'd been waiting for for so long yeah. that uh, there was not a match. No. 
No, we, um, I, I, well, I knew that there was a, a chance through science that we all, um, like even Gregory and I, can fall under the same gen genetic material just based on our DNA. Because we all, everybody on earth possesses about 90 some percent of the same DNA. There is a difference though, at which comes from our ethnicity and certain traits. And uh, I, there was a chance I could fall 5%. I could have fell into that category. But I just, um, I just knew that God uh, never had me in that DNA chain on that other side. So, And in the end, uh, this is what I say to people, Marsha, all the time. In the end, everybody in the, the state of uh, uh, Maryland versus Kirk Noble Bloodsworth was very smart, very, very educated people, the prosecutor, the, the police officers, the, the homicide detectives had 25, 30 years of experience between them. Um, prosecutor was one of the top lawyers in the state of Maryland. Very conscientious and thought after juries in both trials. But at the end of the day, the uh, state of Maryland versus Kirk Noble Bloodsworth were dead wrong. And nobody should have to face that kind of thing in their, in their life ever. You just mentioned your name, which makes me think about your name itself. It's <laughs> just very evocative, you know, which is, I'm sure, why you put it in the, in the title of Bloodsworth, mm. but also noble. Yes. <laughs> my dad's first name. So you have a very interesting name for this case. Yeah. You know. Yeah. It, DNA was, um, you know, I tell people all the time, if you, if this would happen to you, you know, think about it. Think about going to prison and being executed or possibly being executed for a crime you didn't commit. What's your blood's worth? At the end of the day, um, that's what we all have to say. I think, you know, uh, it's, a, it's an indictment against the system in a big way. He's just mentioned a big team, you know, people and then lots of jurors. And we talked about Bob Moore and the attorney. Um, these people are not interviewed in your documentary. You chose to just stay with Mr. Bloodsworth. Yeah. Why was that? Um, well, I felt, you know, he'd, the tr he'd been tried twice, and then he was exonerated. Sort of that the state of Maryland kind of told their story. And I, I, f I thought the more interesting story was to hear um, the exonerated man tell it from his point of view. Um, Part of this, you wanted to bring him back to to the prison itself. That was a big, we did big, go to the that, prison, that was a big yeah. part of yeah. of what you wanted to do, right? To kind it, of reenact the, the the walking out. Certainly, I I, you know, I had a lot of uh, misgivings in the beginning when you know he suggested I do that, and I was like, well, if you think it's going to be good for the film, it's fine. And uh, I was uncomfortable the entire time. You know, um, I had several bad uh, dreams after and it's uh, really hard it, it was the last place I seen my mother alive mm -hmm. and um, and we actually there's a scene where I'm sitting right in the visiting room right where we used to meet and um, take a picture with my dad and stuff so it was really tough but I thought people needed to see me touching those walls you know and just feeling that that uh, how closed in you feel like turning the handle on a vice and it just finally just shuts you up finally when we were wrapping it up I kept asking him I was like are we that done and I, uh, I, I I was ready to leave and yeah. uh, it's a bad bad situation do you still uh uh, aside from making this uh, documentary, do you still have flashbacks? And have I, I suffer from post-traumatic stress mm -hmm. syndrome. I've had it for 30 years, so since all this, well, you know, when I was released, and I, uh, I don't, I'm not medicated or anything, mm -hmm. but I, I do uh, talk to people about this situation on a on a weekly basis, and um, it's something that all exonerated people that I know suffer for it. I belong to an organization called Witness to Innocence, and uh, we are comprised of death row survivors. And uh, you know, everybody in that group suffer from uh, uh, from uh, post-traumatic stress. It's a tough thing. When you hear a siren, 
Um, you watch something on TV. I hear metal keys. Yes. And I kind of get a hair stands up on the back of my neck. So um, it's going to be with you forever. It's like almost like fighting a war. Well, I want to show another clip before we mm -hmm. conclude, and that is related to this, which is what it's like to come home for the first time after you've been incarcerated for nearly nine years. Yeah. I went out in the kitchen and I seen a toaster sitting there and I was staring at this damn thing for like five minutes, you know, and the coffee pot and all the stuff my mother had there was still in place, you know. And I got two pieces of bread and I popped them in the toaster and I pushed that thing down and I was just waiting. And I buttered this toast and I sat it there and I picked up the phone at 4.30 or so in the morning and called Bob Moore on the phone. I said, guess what I'm doing? He says, I don't care. <laughs> it's 4 o'clock in the morning. He says, what are you doing? I said, I'm making toast. And uh, it was... Uh, You don't realize I mean most people we were free you know out here it's still hard no yeah it always will be why do you keep talking about it then so it doesn't happen to anybody else I mean I'm obligated in my soul to uh, be its witness to wrongful conviction and uh, you know the idea that we have a death penalty in the United States scares me to no end we it's 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 not that we aren't entitled to have it that's not what I'm saying but we're not entitled to execute an innocent person uh, it's bad enough if they have to spend years, some as high as 40 years in a place that they don't belong, let alone to be executed for a crime they didn't commit. That is the greatest travesty of all that. And for that reason, I will never stop. And now, with the film Bloodsworth, it is the final chapter to it all. Everybody will have a standard reminder because of Gregory Bang's work. The innocent people go to prison and the death row for something they didn't do. That can never happen. Things seem to be changing in the United States in regards to the death penalty. Um, mm. There are uh, quite a few states that don't have it anymore, including Maryland. Right. And that's shown in your documentary, your work on that issue, the yeah. abolish the death penalty. I, I looked up the stats. There's uh, fewer and fewer people, even just in the last couple of years, who have been executed. The Pope came to the United States yeah. and spoke out against the death penalty. Do you think things are changing? I think I think we're we're well on our way, and I just understand that a Antony Scalia, who is actually a proponent of the de capital punishment in a lot of ways, just came out and said that you know the court will probably abolish it. I hope so. And uh, you know, there's um, Freddie Pitts was a a, a former chairman of the board of Witness to Innocence, and he said it best. Um, you can free a man, person from prison, but you cannot free a person from the grave. We just don't have that talent yet, and uh, we need to get rid of it as soon as possible. It took 10 years before the DNA evidence that exonerated you was used to find the real killer. 10 years, 10 more years before you were truly exonerated. Mm -hmm. uh, and it turned out to be somebody right under people's noses and in fact right under your nose Indeed. or right above your nose he was well, he was right in below right right below your nose then he was in one of the tiers of the, the prison that you were in yeah they they had uh, witnesses that said this person was six foot five curly blonde hair bushy mustache tan skin and skinny well marcia you can certainly see <laughs> i'm not skinny well he wound up being the real killer was five foot six and 160 pounds and he slept uh, in a tier below me for uh, for several years and uh, never said a word. But DNA 
which is God's signature. Um, and another exonerated person said it well. God does not write bad checks. That was that was the real killer. Had you talked to him in prison? I gave him library books and uh, lifted weights with him in the yard. He would never look at me, though. And that's a thing with uh, Bloodsworth. And I'm one of those kind of guys. And I met your governor one time. It's uh, uh, Governor Otter once, and he had a thing. He's always look a person in the eyes, and he never did. And um, I, I never put two and two together. I guess it's a good thing. But you're not angry, uh, you say in the documentary. No. Not anymore. Um, you know, it's a, it's a thing about uh, uh, God. He could take that stuff away from you, wipe the tears away from your eyes. Um, we're still human beings. But um, I, let, I let him take care of it now, or her. And, uh, and uh, it's, uh, it's my job, but my job is, is to tell people about this. And so it doesn't happen anymore. Gregory, what's your hope for the film? We've heard what Kirk's hope is for it. Um, you know, I think, as I said before, I, I don't consider myself an activist in any sense. I don't think I'd be very good at it, but I just wanted to tell a story that sort of exemplified what could potentially go wrong. And that maybe the next time that somebody sees a suspect pictured on TV or, you know, here's an anecdotal thing about this or that crime that, you know, you don't immediately draw all the conclusions because there's so much more generally to the story. Um, and also, you know, that it's not easy. I don't think this is an easy thing to, you know, I commend you always. I mean, it's a, that's what drew me to the story was that you, he continues to talk about it and genuinely wants to not have this ha let this happen to other people. Um, but that's a hefty burden to carry. And, you know, to, you know, I always say, if, you know, when I talk to people about the film, I mean, imagine you're 23 and an event, a crime happens that has nothing to do with you, and then it shapes the entire course of your life. And most of us don't have events like that happen that so utterly transform our lives. Um, and so th that's what really drew me to the story. And, and I hope people kind of walk away with a better understanding of what it's like to go through a scenario like this. Well, thank you. Thanks to you both for thank coming you. here Thanks, to Marcia. talk about your story. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have. I'd like to thank my guests, Kirk Bloodsworth and Gregory Bain. For more information about their documentary, Bloodsworth, An Innocent Man, check out the Dialogue website. Just go to idahoptv.org and click on Dialogue. For Dialogue, I'm Marcia Franklin. Thanks for tuning in. presentation of Dialogue on Idaho Public Television is made possible through the generous support of the Laura Moore Cunningham Foundation, committed to fulfilling the Moore and Bettis family legacy of building the great state of Idaho. By the Friends of Idaho Public Television and by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting.